this week or next week. But like early next week. Yeah. Uh, I'm not super concerned as long as I know that it's not your score. Yeah. 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 For doing that. Uh, I feel like, like honestly, I haven't, I didn't come last week. Because I was like, it's going to start. I feel like a lot of people are doing it. <laughs> they don't study. <laughs> <laughs> you have a pretty hard semester, like 95. Yeah, they my last dresser. I also don't have any pants. No more money. Also, like, I don't have my braid. So the only class that I actually know how long is a counter. I just got it from my favorite That was like better. I was like expecting more. my average for the week. So I think so today was the first day that I'm doing the signal. I possibly could get this because <laughs> I could have. <laughs> I got a, I got a hundred percent of all that's written, <laughs> which means it was just the most full choice. It means I could have gotten it. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to class. That's pretty hard. Um, let's get underway. I would like to begin with prayer. Is there um, someone willing to provide us a prayer to get us started? Please. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day and grateful that we can meet together as a class, uh, both in person and online. And Father, we ask you to please bless us that we'll have a great class today and we'll be able to be guided by the Spirit and be able to learn and understand what we're being taught. We love you so much and please bless uh, us that we'll be able to get back to normal uh, as much as possible, as soon as possible. We love you and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, so uh, a little update, uh, the grading of the exams is going well, but it's not complete. Um, the expectation is that it might be done by the end of the weekend, maybe more likely the first part of next week. So um, please be aware of that. Um, as a matter of policy, if there's an issue with the way things are added up on the exam, please visit with one of the TAs. If you have a more significant kind of issue, um, I'm happy to review that with you. Um, so the key for exam one is on a learning suite at this point, but you don't have the exams back yet to, to make that comparison. But uh, that resource is there for you. Are there questions that you have? Then uh, I'd like to pick up where we left off. We had been talking about the sphingolipids. These are lipids that are uh, used as a backbone, the sphingosine molecule, then are there are um, further modifications of sphingosine. I'm not going to review all of those, but I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about the ganglioside,s which are the more the most comp complex of these sphingophospho uh, sphingolipids. They're not phospholipids; they're glycolipids. Um, and then we will continue on uh, looking at or just talking briefly about several different classes of lipids. We will spend a bit more time on two groups, the icosanoids, also known as the prostanoids, 
And on uh, steroid hormones, we will spend a bit more time on these, go into more detail about them. All right. I apologize. I will be using uh, a fair number of slides today simply to uh, allow us to move through these, these materials more efficiently. So. Let me, oops, let me go back ever so briefly here. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the bottom um, figure, the bottom of the figure, uh, you'll see gangliosides listed. So they have, they have as a component sphingosine. The one hydroxyl group of sphingosine has been modified with this carbohydrate extension. And gangliosides are <clears throat> um, dis distinguished by their having a uh, more substantial amount of carb carbohydrate uh, modifying that hydroxyl group. In particular, branched carbohydrates in many, perhaps most instances, and the presence of acidic sugars. And we'll talk a little bit about that because we haven't really spent much time talking about acidic sugars, but here is one that is a, a common feature of these gangliosides. As you can see, this is a very complicated looking sugar. Uh, it, it, it is a, um, an amino sugar, and it has been modified further with the presence of uh, carboxylate. Um, so we see uh, up on the right hand corner, this carboxyl, carboxylate group. And these uh, are features then of the gangliosides. So in addition to branching, there are frequently, most often, the presence of these um, acidic sugars. This, this is a, uh, a sialic acid. And we will talk at some point more about sialic acids. Uh, they have some special functions. These gangliosides now are on the outer leaf of the lipid bilayer of cells. They present the carbohydrate to the uh, extracellular space to the environment outside the cell. And they serve as receptors or cell recognition sites. They are the site where other molecules will bind and that will initiate certain types of activity. Uh, let me, so for example, um, the gangliosides are <clears throat> the uh, features of red blood cells that give rise to blood type. And you can see here the uh, different arrangements that can be uh, observed that uh, distinguish A from B from O. If we uh, transfuse an individual with blood that is not of the same type, it leads to an immune response. So again, antibodies are produced against that particular uh, ganglioside that is sticking out from these red blood cells. It leads to the destruction of the red blood cells, hemolysis, anemia, and uh, if unchecked, can lead to death. So the gangliosides then are this distinctive group of sphingoglycolipids that serve as cell signaling molecules found on the outside of cells. Um, let me go back, oops, one slide. Okay. Um, I wanted to just mention another set of sphingolipids, and these are the sulfatides. So uh, there's a, actually a fairly substantial uh, group of these. They don't have all the same structure but they are distinguished by their having um, a sulfate on the sugar ring. This again is uh, the sphingosine 
Um, let me just point out a couple things here. Um, so uh, we have then uh, the single sing tail, which out here comes down, ends in this hydroxyl group right here. We have a fatty acid appended to the amine group on the two carbon. And then we have this sugar. This is a galactose molecule that has been modified with the sulfate group. Uh, <clears throat> these are found frequently, not uh, uniquely, but frequently in the outer leaf of the uh, myelin uh, membrane cells. And as a role, they play, I mean, they have some significant role in uh, neural transmission, neural cells, neural tissues. It's, uh, there are, and uh, alterations in these, <clears throat> uh, or in the abundance of these, have been found with uh, certain diseases. Even uh, Alzheimer's disease seems to have alterations in the abundance of these sulfatides. So I'm just making you aware of these. These are important. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but um, they are part of the uh, group of sphingolipids that, uh, that, are, that exist. Okay. <clears throat> Briefly, I want to just indicate there are another set of lipids, this now, the, these uh, use, again, glycerol as their backbone. But they differ in that they have an ether, ether linkage to the first fatty acid. And this is sufficient that these have very unique and different functions. So, um, the um, plasmologen, platelet activating factor, these are very, very potent regulatory molecules. They are active at extraordinarily low concentrations. They are part of uh, you know, platelet activating factors. You can see uh, in, indicates that it's involved in clotting or can be, it can promote that. So uh, again, um, just giving you a sense for the breadth of the uh, lipids in our body and that they're not all so simple as a triacylglycerol, which is just a source of energy in our diet. Uh, many of these play extremely important roles in both normal physiology and in disease. <clears throat> okay. Here's another category. I apologize for going through these very quickly. I don't expect you to know much about these except that they exist. But let me describe waxes. Okay, waxes are these very hydrophobic materials that coat, um, for example, feathers uh, on birds to make them more waterproof. Uh, such things are found on fruit that makes them more waterproof. They are composed of the following, a long chain fatty acid and a very long chain alcohol coupled together through an ester linkage. So uh, these then represent a very long arrays of hydrocarbons, making them very hydrophobic, very water resistant, repellent, however you want to think of it. Cholesterol is a lipid. Cholesterol is a very important compound. Uh, we hear uh, a lot in the, uh, in the area of diet and uh, dietary risk for certain diseases, and cholesterol is right there <clears throat> at, uh, among the, uh, at the forefront of uh, some of this information. But the reality is that we absolutely need cholesterol Without cholesterol, we, uh, we can't survive. So our bodies make about 85% of the cholesterol that is present in our blood. Consequent consequently, people who have high cholesterol almost always 
have some sort of genetic or familial predisposition to high cholesterol levels. And we will talk about um, this in more detail at uh, another point. Cholesterol is found in membranes, cell membranes, and uh, they are critical for having the right consistency to that membrane. Cholesterol is also a precursor for a, a number of other compounds. Uh, we'll talk about one in the next slide, and that is bile salts or bile acids. Another, though, are the steroid hormones. So anytime we talk about steroids or steroids, these are derivatives of uh, cholesterol. So <clears throat> it has a characteristic uh, fuse ring system, as you can see down here at the bottom. So this four-membered fused, uh, fused ring system is uh, a hallmark of cholesterol or compounds that are derived, produced from uh, cholesterol as a starting material. The OL at the end represents this alcohol group uh, on the three carbon of cholesterol. Here are, here's one example of a bile salt. <clears throat> um, these are produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder. They are dumped into the small intestine as food enters the small intestine. They uh, form, they coat and uh, form micelles, these small uh, globular arrangements of, uh, of fats, uh, triacylglycerols that are present in the diet. We will definitely talk more about this in a later chapter. But uh, the ability to, um, th so the bile salts act as a detergent. You can see that they have typically a, they have something like this has a sulfonic acid group on it. This region, the fused ring system region is very hydrophobic. <clears throat> the sulfonic acid group allows uh, this to serve as a detergent. So the charged sulfonic acid group interfaces effectively with water, while the uh, hydrophobic region is able to interact favorably and sequester uh, hydrophobic materials. So oils, grime, so on and so forth, is what we think of with uh, detergents in the washing machine, but this now is able to sequester fats and oils that are part of our diet, causing them to be present in very, very tiny um, particles that are termed micelles. Okay, um, we're going to switch slides at this point. Are there questions before I move this? So um, <clears throat> we will come back and talk about, but th you'll, this is cholesterol, oops, cholesterol again. Let me just take a minute here to indicate that um, in order to convert this into other things, this side chain is either eliminated or modified. For, for the bile salts, we add some sort of uh, acidic, functional group to the side chain. If we're talking about the formation of steroid hormones, then there usually is a truncation of most or all of that alkyl side chain that's present on cholesterol. All right, um, in, in preparing to talk about um, the icosanoids, I want to spend just a minute talking about a group of enzymes called the phospholipases. The phospholipases are able to release pieces of 
these membrane lipids. In, in particular, we're talking about glycerophospholipids. Uh, <clears throat> so here is our glycerol backbone that indicated here. And here are these two fatty acids that are present in most lipid, uh, most lipid, most membrane lipids. So remember that the uh, the number the one the one fatty acid is usually most frequently a saturated fatty acid. The the fatty acid modifying the two hydroxyl group is most often an unsaturated fatty acid. And <clears throat> very frequently, the, at least on the interior leaf, the interior uh, layer of the lipid bilayer, the, the uh, phospholipids that interface with the cytosol, we will have arachidonic acid. Um, this, this was one of those fatty acids on that table. It has 20 carbons and four double bonds. So it is, uh, it is rather unique, but it is the precursor for the eicosanoid compound. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Consequently, if we are to produce increased levels of the eicosanoids, that is a consequence of increased levels of phospholipase A2. You following me? So the arachidonic acid is on the interior layer of the lipid bilayer. It interfaces with <clears throat> the cytosol. The phospholipase A2 is inside the cell and under certain stimuli, it will cleave the arachidonic acid from the two hydroxyl group of the uh, glycerol. And this leads then to the production of these other compounds. Let me draw your attention now to this uh, species, this molecule attached down here. So this looks like it is a sugar, but in reality, it is not. It is a cyclohexane ring. Notice there is no ring oxygen. This is not a hemiacetal or acetal. It is cyclohexane, but it is modified with multiple hydroxyl groups. And some of these are further modified by the presence of phos phosphate groups. The <clears throat> phospholipase C is a common, it is a common mediator of chemical or biological reactions within the cell. So activation of pathways within the cell uh, results in the activation of phospholipase C, which releases now the third phosphate with the this cyclohexane species, this, this is called inositol. Inositol then with one, with a uh, one, four, five phosphate, uh, triphosphate group, groups, uh, is a very, very, very potent uh, intracellular signal. It leads to, among other things, the release of calcium from intracellular stores, uh, if you're talking about endocrine cells, this leads to the secretion of hormones, regulatory com compounds from these cells. So IP3, inositol 3-phosphate, 1,4,5,3-triphosphate, uh, is this signaling molecule, but it, it is produced by the phospholipase C, which is responding to some sort of cell surface signal that is initiating intracellular events. Okay. Any questions about this? Anyone out in the uh, Dr. Audience? Graves? Yes, sir. What does IP3 stand for? Inositol 
1,4,5-triphosphate. So inositol phosphate 3 is a th triphosphate. So 1,4,5-inositol phosphate. And it is, as mentioned, a very potent uh, intracellular signaling molecule. Okay, let's now talk about the eicosanoids. Um, we are more familiar with these than you would think. Uh, <clears throat> these compounds, as mentioned, are all derived from arachidonic acid. All of them have 20 carbons. The icoso means 20. And the 20 here refers to the number of carbons present in these different icosanoid compounds. They have 20 carbons because they come from a 20 carbon fatty acid, arachidonic acid. These compounds are produced once the arachidonic acid is released by phospholipase A2. So, um, and they, um, they mediate a, a series of responses that are relatively familiar. So pain, fever, redness, swelling, other more general inflammatory responses, these are all mediated by uh, a group of these eicosanoids called prostaglandins. You may have heard of prostaglandins. When we take aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, um, it, these over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, painkillers, they are acting to inhibit the production of the prostaglandins and another series of compounds called the thromboxanes. Thromboxanes are involved in clotting. As <clears throat> the term thrombus is the medical term for a blood clot. So thromboxanes uh, bring about the formation of blood clots, platelet aggregation. So these, uh, these prostaglandins have a wide variety of activities. There are several of these that I'll, in the next slide, it goes over some of these, but uh, they're all, um, there, there are several prostaglandins and the, the, the thing that complicates life is that the same prostaglandin can actually produce opposite effects in different tissues. The reason that it's going to cause, in one case, a vasodilation, and in another case, vasoconstriction, has to do with the receptor that is present in a given tissue. So the compound hasn't changed, but its effect is determined by the receptor present in a particular tissue. So um, these compounds are, in many instances, uh, in many instances, mediate blood flow in a given vascular bed. As mentioned, they can cause an increase in blood flow. This would be vasodilation, where you open the vessels and more blood flows or can cause vasoconstriction and a reduction in blood flow in a given area. Um, but they have potentially uh, other types of uh, less well-established and well, less well-understood types of activities. They have been proposed or there's evidence for them participating in our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycles. Uh, they may participate in human labor. Um, so the prostaglandin F2-alpha is actually used to initiate labor in the, uh, in the uh, delivery room. So if somebody needs to be delivered, if the baby's having problems, um, not getting enough oxygen, they will induce labor using one of these prostaglandins prostaglandin F2-alpha. 
There is another category of the eicosanoids termed leukotrienes. These are involved in um, allergic responses. The, uh, for example, asthma or reactive airway disease is mediated in large measure by increases in leukotrienes. Uh, certain types of uh, allergic responses, such as uh, a peanut allergy or a sensitivity to bee venom, these are mediated by leukotrienes. Uh, so the, this condition called anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, uh, that is mediated by leukotrienes. The prostaglandins are produced from arachidonic acid by a series of enzymatic steps, but uh, among these are cyclooxygenases or COX enzymes. There's a COX-1 and a COX-2. There may actually be a COX-3. Uh, and the, um, the painkillers that we are familiar with, aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, and so forth, inhibit these COX enzymes and consequently lower or eliminate the production of these prostaglandins and to some degree, the thromboxane. So aspirin is a uh, compound that is known to produce a level of anticoagulation. So if grandpa has had a heart attack, his doctors may put him on a low dose aspirin thereafter to try to guard against a reoccurrence of a blood clot to his lungs. The leukotrienes, on the other hand, are produced by a series of enzymes called lipoxygenases. And these differ from the um, cyclooxygenases in that they are not inhibited by these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin. So lipoxygenases, their own, they do their own thing. They don't cyclize the arachidonic acid molecule. Okay, this lists much of what we've talked about here. Um, just going to point out that uh, one of the interesting things is that, at least to me, that the, uh, the prostaglandin E2 will cause microvessel permeability. So what does this mean? Well, this, this is why your ankle swells, okay? liquid is actually leaking from the blood vessels into the surrounding tissue, causing the swelling to take place. Again, a consequence of these prostaglandins. So these responses are extraordinarily fast. You only have to twist your ankle and a minute or two later, you're in pain, your ankle is swelling, it's turning red, and all of this happens very rapidly but it involves a series of events of the phospholipase A2, releasing arachidonic acid, the cyclooxygenases, uh, producing the prostaglandin, uh, prostaglandins, and then the effects being seen very quickly. Okay, so now we can actually see a little bit. Here's our uh, initial, here's the arachidonic acid. This is going to be released to the cytosol, the phospholipases are in the cytosol. So once, uh, once you initiate in the activity of the phospholipases, they will act on arachidonic acid. You can see that we have uh, these cyclooxygenases that do different things. The prostaglandins have this five-membered ring so we're bridging double bonds here to form these ring systems. In the case of uh, the prostaglandins, we have no oxygen in the ring. We have a five-membered ring. For the thromboxanes, we, have a, we are still closing the same double bonds, but in this case, we are adding an oxygen to the ring, and uh, we have this 
odd epoxide sticking out there. In the case of the leukotrienes, we have no um, we have no closure of double bonds across the arachidonic acid to form a ring across the arachidonic acid, but we do have this epoxide here on, um, on the hydrocarbon chain of the fatty acid. Okay. Um, all of this is really summarized reasonably well in the book. The slides also provide some small amount of additional information. So if you are having questions, hopefully you can review these uh, in your textbook. Okay, we are now considering an entirely different kind of lipid. This, uh, these lipids are made up of a small subunit called an isoprene subunit or an isoprene molecule. These compounds, as you can see, have a branched methyl group. They have double bonds and they're formed into longer chains. Uh, cholesterol itself can be thought of as an isoprene compound. It is uh, made up of multiple subunits. Um, in this case, uh, we are looking at the formation of vitamin D. It's considered to be both a uh, cholesterol derivative, but it is also fundamentally uh, sort of an isoprene compound. Uh, we start off to form uh, vitamin D with this seven dehydro cholesterol. So uh, right here in pink, you can see there is, well, there is a susceptible bond. And this bond is actually cleaved by UV light, okay? So when people recommend that you get sunlight to improve your bone health, calcium absorption, they are talking about this process where the UV light is able to penetrate small vessels in the skin and bring about this transformation of the 7-dehydro cholesterol into a compound called cholecalciferol. This is a preliminary type of vitamin D. It is not biologically active. It requires further hydroxylation to be biologically active. One of these uh, um, Hydroxylations occurs in the liver, the 25 hydroxylation. So notice up here that we've added a 25 hydroxyl group. And uh, we also, I think in the kidney, are um, adding a one hydroxyl group, having the three hydroxyl groups, the three, the one, the 25, makes us now biologically active. It acts uh, on the gut to allow for greater calcium absorption. And so calcium absorption is critical for bone synthesis. It's also important for heart health. The circulating concentration of calcium is critical to have a healthy heart with normal rhythm. Okay. <clears throat> Interestingly, uh, the placenta can also bring about one hydroxylation, which means that in a pregnant woman, the levels of vitamin D are going to be higher, allowing for greater calcium absorption to help meet the need of the growing fetus. So the baby's forming bones. If the mother is not able to get sufficient vitamin D, the baby will actually um, use the calcium from the mom and uh, will actually jeopardize the bone health of the mother in order to meet the, the fetus's needs. Sometimes in pregnancy, if women don't get outside, they don't take a supplement of calcium and vitamin D. 
uh, they can actually develop osteopenia, which is a, a, a thinning of the bones in, in the mother. Yes? You said that the placenta can um, add a hydroxyl group? Yes, yeah. so the, the, the placenta has the one hydroxylase. Okay. And as a consequence, it's able to convert the preliminary forms of the colocalciferol into the fully biologically active form, allowing for more calcium absorption. Yes? So the one hydroxylase hydroxylates the both sites at the top and bottom? No, there's a 25 hydroxylase in a, I think it's in the liver and a one hydroxylase that we have in our kidney, but the placenta has the one hydroxylase and is able consequently to generate more biologically active vitamin D leading to greater, greater calcium absorption. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so Is it? Okay. <clears throat> um, there, uh, we, we get vitamin D in our milk uh, and so forth. When I was uh, back in Massachusetts, there was a dairy company that mistakenly put fully biologically active vitamin D in their milk. Normally they put in the precursor form and the body then hydroxylates as much as it needs, but they, were, they accidentally put in the fully biologically active and it ended up killing several people. Uh, it was the end of the, that dairy, um, unfortunately. Unfortunately, uh, but yeah, so, um, it's calcium is an interesting material. Our body absolutely needs it, but too much or too little can have devastating consequences. Okay. Um, vitamin A is another uh, isoprene compound. If you want to think about it, you can see now these isoprene subunits, they're a little bit easier to see here. Uh, vitamin A, is converted into our uh, to a visual pigment um, called all uh, all cis or I mean uh, eleven cis um, retinal, and this is the primary visual pigment. That is to say, again, as light, uh, typically in the vi in the um, visible range, passes through the lens and uh, interacts with the retina, there is this uh, conversion of the cis retinal into trans retinal. And this is responsible for our ability to see. So that bond has to be very susceptible. It is has a particular uh, stability that is overcome by just visible light, UV light, bringing about our ability to see. So eating carrots, a source of beta carotene, uh, is converted in into this visual pigment. So mom is right, eat your carrots, you'll see better. So, but again, these, um, this, these are isoprene compounds. Vitamin E, which is an antioxidant associated with membranes. Notice how that, that, that uh, long tail is going to make it associate with the plasma membrane of a cell, protects it against oxidative damage. Reactive oxygen species such as superoxide, hydroxyl radicals, hydrogen peroxide, all of these can be scavenged by the vitamin E instead of damaging um, the lipids in the membrane. Vitamin K, another isoprene compound involving clotting, and it keeps going on. So there are several of these. Ubiquinone is part of the electron transport chain, an electron carrier found in the mitochondrial inner membrane that transports electrons. Okay, some additional isoprenes are added to proteins and allow for their movement within the cell. 
to a selected membrane uh, within the cell. So again, uh, a wide variety of functions, very critical um, for normal cell physiology. All right, we're going to end up now with the uh, steroids. And we're going to talk about them more next time. In fact, we're going to have a special topic that involves one of these uh, steroid hormones called cortisol. Uh, but as you can see here, we have, um, here are represented four different classes. So this is uh, the androgens are typified by testosterone. They have a 17 hydroxyl group. So this is the 17 carbon here. Uh, they have this three keto group. Um, and you'll notice that estradiol, so this is the second category, the uh, estrogens, actually looks remarkably similar to testosterone you'll know that they have profoundly different activities within the body. So a 17 hydroxyl group, in fact, the, the, uh, these three rings over here uh, are identical in terms of their shape, size, uh, modifications as, uh, as, is, as are found in the androgens. But what differs is that there is this aromatic A ring. This is the A ring here. Um, and we have over here uh, a, this, we have a three hydroxyl group. Whereas here we have this three keto group. Here we have this four, five ene. That small modification or the seemingly small modifications of the A ring differentiate the activity, the effects of the estrogens from the androgens. Okay, <clears throat> we'll come back and talk about these other two. The cortisol is uh, representative of what's called the glucocorticoids. And these other two com compounds on the bottom, prednisolone and prednisone, are um, equivalent in terms of their uh, function as cortisol, they're just more potent. And then the fourth group indicated here are uh, the mineralocorticoids, the primary one being aldosterone. These are sodium conserving hormones and uh, are increased in response to uh, low sodium in our diet um, and cause an increase in sodium resorption from the kidney from the uh, renal tubule. We'll, we'll talk about this next time. Are there questions before we? Dr. Graves. Yes, sir. So I've noticed that we've obviously gone over a lot and some people are wondering in the chat as well, like out of all this stuff, like do you, like what exactly do you want us to know? I just feel like we went over a lot of structures and a lot of names and I'm just right. curious to know like what exactly we should know. We should know the phospholipases, the eicosanoids, and the steroid hormones, okay? Like, like know them, like know their function? Or yes, know them, like, like know their function, know a little bit about their structures, how they're produced, where they act, what their consequences are, how you inhibit them in the case of the eicosanoids. So yes, whatever level of detail is provided by the book and slides you should know for those and for the steroids. Um, maybe vitamin D a little bit, okay? That would be the other one that probably is sufficiently important physiologically that we keep track of it. All right, let me move this story forward another round. So I'd gone off to basic training. Um, I had attempted to go to church or had wanted to go to church and attempted to go to church three times, three weeks. So uh, I had um, made the effort and had nothing to show for it. I, I, this was a difficult time in my life. This was very stressful. I felt an enormous need to get to church to revisit sanity and people who were um, decent people uh, rather than 
have to deal with all of this stuff that one deals with as part of basic training. I have met somebody uh, from the church. My platoon sergeant had graciously taken me to the location where the meeting should have been held. It was not held. They had moved services off base, but we had met this gentleman who promised to come pick me up the following Sunday. He would come to my unit right there on base, pick me up in front of my barracks. Well, that Monday, we learned that our company was going to have guard duty the following Sunday. Everybody in the company was going to have guard duty the following Sunday. We spent, the, we spent much of the week polishing our boots, polishing our buckles, uh, getting, our, getting a set of fatigue starch so we look, um, look good. And uh, I had no way of contacting this gentleman. Uh, I, I may have remembered his name, but I had no phone number. I had no access to any phone. That was strictly forbidden for, uh, for uh, the trainees in the area. Uh, my platoon sergeant didn't know who he was. We, we had no way of trying to let him know that I would not be available that Sunday. And so, uh, again, I was very disappointed. This was going to be now the fourth Sunday in a row, five weeks I was going to go without being able to get to church. I had prayed about this. I wanted it. it was, I was commanded to do it, and yet I couldn't seem to get to church. So we'll have to leave me there. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Please be safe. Please stay well.